What's up everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Da Vinci Cases. Alright, so the way this works is we've got a clinical case followed by a board style question. So we're going to go through the question stem, point out the relevant clinical findings, take a look at the question and the answer choices, and then kind of divert for a minute and go through the relevant concepts to answering the question. Then we'll come back and apply those concepts that we went over to answering the question. Alright, so for this case we've got a 34 year old woman, no significant past medical history, visiting her primary care physician for worsening dyspnea on exertion and fatigue for the past two years. So this is a young, otherwise healthy woman, but she's been living with these uh, symptoms that are she's been experiencing over a significant period of time. And dyspnea or shortness of breath, you definitely want to characterize it just like you do with chest pain. How long has it been going on? Is it you know at rest? Is it with exertion? Um, so obviously very key to understand. Obviously, it's the same thing with chest pain. If you get dyspnea at rest, in addition to exertion, that's much worse. But nevertheless, you know, dyspnea on exertion, just like chest pain with exertion, uh, can be very serious as well. Also, she's having fatigue. So her symptoms have dramatically worsened over the past month. So although she's been living with these for the past two years, it's getting much worse uh, over a short period of time. And this is including uh, experiencing chest pain and dyspnea with uh, mild activities, such as walking down her driveway to get the mail. So this is really progressed to a point. She's having chest pain also, and these are mild activities. It's not like she's, you know, running down the street and back. Um, you know, these, you know, it's literally she's just kind of walking down the driveway. So this is pretty significant that she's having these these symptoms, and it's getting much worse like this. So her physical exam is notable for elevated jugular venous pressure, a loud P2, and S3 on cardiac auscultation. So first, the elevated jugular venous pressure. And for that, let's actually draw a little diagram over here. So you have the internal jugular vein that kind of joins at the junction of the subclavian vein and the brachiocephalic. And remember the brachiocephalics join together to form the superior vena cava. And then if you go out this way, it's the same thing on the other side. And then the SVC drains into the right atrium. You have the tricuspid valve that separates the right atrium from the right ventricle. And then the right ventricle pumps out through the pulmonic valve into pulmonary vasculature. So what happens is, is that elevated jugular venous pressure is a sign that the right heart is not pumping efficiently. And so it's, it just makes sense. If you have backup of pressure, it's going to cause backup and backup all the way in through the pipes or the blood vessels and into the jugular veins, and you're going to see distension and in, increased pressure within those jugular veins. So that's a sign. The loud P2 is part of the pulmonic valve, and then the S3 is a sign of volume overload, very commonly heard in heart failure. With right-sided heart failure, you have kind of physiological causes or pathophysiological causes. The most common cause is left-sided heart failure. Uh, you also have more primary causes, which are either uh, often idiopathic or hereditary. And actually younger women uh, are kind of the demographic that fit into uh, those two types, the primary types. So you definitely want to be considering that at this point as well. So her PCP orders a transthoracic echocardiogram because this is a young woman. She's got symptoms of heart failure, which is shortness of breath on exertion. Definitely a symptom of heart failure getting worse. She's got these elevated jugular venous pressures, a loud P2 and an S3. These are all definitely signs of, echo, of heart failure. So you want to get an echo to further evaluate that. So it reveals elevated pulmonary artery systolic pressure. And so, again, that's kind of a sign of pulmonary hypertension. She's got right ventricular hypertrophy and then right heart failure. So this makes sense. It's corresponding to what we're seeing on exam. It's also corresponding to what we see uh, symptoms-wise. Notice no mention of left-sided heart failure. So this is exclusively right-side heart failure. And you're seeing it right here. The echo gives it to you. You have pulmonary hypertension. And so if you have elevated pressures in these pulmonary arteries, it's the same thing as when you have systemic hypertension on the left ventricle. You know, it creates more resistance for the left side of the heart. 
the heart has to work harder to generate the same amount of pressure to pump blood through. And so what happens over time is, remember, the left side of the heart, you get left ventricular hypertrophy. Same thing happens here. The right ventricle develops hypertrophy over time, and then it leads to right heart failure. So she is scheduled for cardiac catheterization and started on a new medication. The question is, this patient's new medication inhibits which of the following? With this type of question, it's kind of a two-part question. You need to first figure out what the diagnosis is, and we've figured that out to be pulmonary hypertension, most likely primary pulmonary hypertension because there's no mention of left side of heart failure. There's no mention of her having a shunt or anything like that. And then she's starting on this new medication. And so they're asking, what is the most likely mechanism of a new medication you would start a patient with pulmonary hypertension on? So again, our key findings, just to summarize everything, we've got a young, otherwise healthy woman presenting with acute worsening of chronic dyspnea on exertion, now with associated chest pain. These physical exam is notable for signs of right heart failure. Her echo reveals pulmonary hypertension and associated right heart failure. Is she is sent to a cardiac catheterization to confirm the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension? And then she started on a new medication to treat pulmonary hypertension. So it's essentially asking you which of these are, is a mechanism of medication to treat pulmonary hypertension exclusively. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break from the case right now to let you know that DaVinci Cases is brought to you by DaVinci Academy which provides online video courses for the medical basic sciences. These courses are taught using a variety of teaching methods, including bullet point outlines, diagrams, radiology images, and chalk talks to explain the fundamental concepts. We then teach the application of those concepts to numerous clinical pearls that are frequently tested on medical school exams and the USMLE. Our video courses are available on our website, dviacademy.com, as monthly subscriptions starting at $9.99 per month. Each video course has a corresponding outline format textbook as well. You can find the link to our website in the description below. Also be sure to use the discount code DC20 to receive 20% off any of our video courses. Now back to the case. So very briefly, just to kind of cover a couple things here, pulmonary hypertension, demographics, like I mentioned, females much more common than males for primary hypertension. That's not secondary. So primary means it's either idiopathic, meaning we don't know what causes it, and it's kind of isolated pulmonary hypertension, or hereditary pulmonary hypertension, which means there's a genetic cause. Again, it's isolated. It's not necessarily related to left side heart failure versus secondary pulmonary hypertension. Remember, the number one cause of that is left side heart failure. You can also have left to right shunts that cause that. You can also see it in patients with significant lung disease like COPD, obstructive sleep apnea, and pulmonary fibrosis. If patients develop chronic pulmonary embolisms, that can cause them as well. And then autoimmune diseases and infection can also potentially be a cause. The general pathogenesis, whether it's primary or secondary, you have increased pulmonary pressure. This leads to vascular wall injury plus smooth muscle cell proliferation within the vascular wall. And then you have vessel fibrosis, which develops. All of these collectively together lead to increased pulmonary vascular resistance, like I was talking about. That creates increased strain on the right ventricle, so you have right ventricular hypertrophy, which then eventually leads to right heart failure. Then on presentation, again, just like we see in our patient, dyspnea on exertion, because you're not oxygenated as well, uh, fatigue, symptoms of right heart failure, you see a loud P2 or pulmonic 2 and or an S3 on auscultation, the elevated JVP like we talked about. You can also see a right-sided heave on exam when you ask them to breathe. That's kind of a pathognomonic or a buzzword for pulmonary hypertension. You can also see hepatomegalia because remember how we talked about the pressure backing up through the venous system that can all go, can continue going past the jugular vein. It can actually continue into the IVC. In addition to going superior, it can also go inferior into the IVC and then lead to dilation and enlargement of the liver. So diagnosis-wise, you get an echocardiogram like we uh, saw with our patient. You can do a CT angiogram or right heart catheterization like our patient's going to get. This is a gold standard for diagnosing pulmonary hypertension. Treatment, you can give prostacyclin, endothelin receptor antagonists, and PDE5 inhibitors or phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. This is the same mechanism as sildenafil, which is also known as 
uh, Viagra, use to treat erectile dysfunction. So we come back here, we can go through some of these answer choices. So again, it's asking which of the following is the mechanism of action of a medication used to treat pulmonary hypertension. So first, vascular smooth muscle calcium channels. So these are essentially calcium channel blockers. These are very commonly used, as you may know, for systemic hypertension. However, they're not used for pulmonary hypertension. Inhibition of cyclooxygenase 1 or COX-1 and cyclooxygenase 2 or COX-2. This is actually the mechanism of aspirin. Aspirin, obviously, very commonly given for patients with coronary artery disease or stroke. So people have a MI or a stroke, they're often put on aspirin. Patients get a stent place, they're often put on aspirin. However, it's not given necessary for exclusively for pulmonary hypertension. Inhibition of the sodium potassium chloride co-transporter in the thick ascending limb of the nephron. This is the mechanism of action of a loop diuretic or furosemide, also known as Lasix, very commonly given for heart failure, congestive heart failure. Again, this is not given exclusively for pulmonary hypertension. This is really uh, given to treat the symptoms of volume overload and decrease the stress on the heart. Endothelin receptor blockers or antagonists, uh, as we mentioned in the, one of the previous slides, these are one of the types of drugs given for pulmonary hypertension. The reason for that is by blocking the endothelin receptor, you decrease pulmonary vasoconstriction. So here we have this nice little diagram to show you that. So you have these endothelial cells, and then you have the vascular smooth muscle cells, obviously associated with the pulmonary vasculature. You have endothelin 1, and then you have these endothelin A and endothelin B receptors. Both A and B receptors are on the vascular smooth muscle cells, and then just the Bs are on the endothelial cells. So endothelin, the actual molecule itself, is a peptide that binds the endothelin A and B receptors and uh, triggers those. These are both G protein coupled receptors. They're coupled to the GQ protein, uh, which then converts PIP to IP3. And then as you know, IP3 goes to the sarcoplasmic reticulum and triggers release of calcium, which then triggers contraction of the vascular smooth muscle, which then leads to vasoconstriction, further exacerbating pulmonary hypertension. Endothelin B is also present on endothelial cells. So endothelin can stimulate those receptors on endothelial cells. However, in endothelial cells, they have a different mechanism. They actually stimulate the synthesis of nitric oxide or NO, which is a vasodilator. So then NO can actually counteract this and cause vasodilation. Now these are, these exact mechanisms and the whole interplay of this is still an area of study, but it's kind of interesting to see kind of these different reactions to binding of the same receptor in two different cell types. You have your endothelin receptor inhibitors that come in. This is what's given to treat pulmonary hypertension or one of the medications used. It's going to inhibit binding of endothelin to the endothelin A receptor on vascular smooth muscle cells. Also going to inhibit binding to the endothelin B receptors on vascular smooth muscle cells. However, it lets the, it bind the endothelin B receptors on endothelial cells. So then you get release of nitric oxide still and you're blocking vascular smooth muscle contraction. And so what that collectively leads to is vasodilation. And as you can see, vasodilating the pulmonary vasculature can help treat pulmonary hypertension. And so the last answer choice here, angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE blocking that, those are ACE inhibitors, as you probably know, very common medications used for hypertension, used for heart failure. Um, they are not used, however, for exclusively to treat pulmonary hypertension. So to summarize this, this is a young woman that has primary pulmonary hypertension with associated right-sided heart failure. It is symptomatic and is given a new medication, which is an endothelin receptor blocker to treat her pulmonary hypertension. All right, that's all I have for you this time. Be sure to check out all the Da Vinci Cases videos available on our YouTube channel and our website, dviacademy.com. The PDF notes for every Da Vinci Cases is also available on our website. Also be sure to check out our podcast, The Da Vinci Hour, where we interview attendings and residents across medicine to learn more about their experiences, their specialties, and to get their insights on navigating a career in medicine. You can find the Da Vinci Hour podcast on our website or any platform where podcasts are found. Lastly, you can find all of our video courses and corresponding outline form books on our website. Don't forget to use the discount code DC20 for 20% off.